All righty. Well, it looks like it's three o'clock. So welcome everyone to today's virtual AMO seminar. I uh, just want to start with a little bit of logistics. So as always, feel free to enter questions into either the chat on the Zoom or the feed on the YouTube Live. And we particularly welcome questions from students and postdocs. Um, I would also like to welcome, we have three new panelists. Um, Ivan Deutsch couldn't join us today, but we have Aziza Suleimanzadeh and uh, Christy Chu joining us. Um, and last but certainly not least, I'd like to introduce our speaker for today. We're going to have Alexei Gorshkov. Um, so Alexei is an amazing quantum theorist. Um, and so he's currently at NIST as well as the Joint Quantum Institute and the Joint Center for Quantum Information and Computer Science. And he's going to tell us many interesting things. So Alexei. Thank you, Alicia. Thanks uh, everybody else, Adam and company for uh, inviting and thanks to uh, everybody for listening. Um, so I will talk about dynamics of quantum systems uh, with uh, long range interactions. Uh, so because of screening, uh, typical condensed matter systems are often uh, well described by short range interactions, which we will define today as uh, interactions that are either strictly finite range or the decaying ex decay exponentially with distance. On the other hand, uh, many AMO and other synthetic quantum systems are often well described by long range interactions, which we will define as interactions that decay slower than an exponential. And a prime example is interactions that decay with distance r as one of artists and power alpha. Examples include dipolar interactions between electric dipoles such as Rydberg atoms, uh, uh, excitons or polar molecules, or magnetic dipoles such as magnetic atoms uh, and NV centers. Another example is van der Waals type 1 over to the six interactions between Rydberg atoms, and you've heard about those uh, uh, from Manuel last week. And finally, you can get uh, one of order the alpha interactions with a tunable uh, exponent alpha, as well as other more complicated types of interactions between, uh, for example, internal spin states of ion crystals, where the interaction is uh, mediated by the motion, or atoms in multimode cavities or along waveguides, where the interactions are mediated by the photons. So these interactions are among the strongest and most tunable interactions that are available in AMO. Uh, and as a result, they are ideal uh, for studying strongly interacting quantum antibody physics uh, and building quantum technologies such as quantum computers, entanglement enhanced sensors, and the nodes of the quantum internet. So long range interactions have lots of interesting features. Uh, for example, you can send an unknown quantum state faster uh, across a chain if it has long range interactions. So suppose you're trying to send a quantum state from this uh, blue qubit to the red qubit. And if you only have nearest neighbor interactions, then essentially the fastest thing you can do is just swap your information along the chain. On the other hand, if you have direct uh, strong long range interactions between the blue qubit and the red qubit, you can imagine that you can send quantum information faster in this case. You can also do faster quantum computing and faster preparation of entangled states kind of by a similar token. Uh, long range interactions can also mask the dimensionality of your system. Uh, for example, if all your qubits are interacting equally stronger, uh, equally strong with uh, all the other qubits, uh, then it doesn't really matter what dimensionality they sit in. So today we'll ask a question of how quickly can quantum information propagate in these systems with long range interactions. So for this, uh, I'll need to introduce this concept of Lee Robinson bounds. So suppose we have a lattice in arbitrary dimension, but for simplicity, I will draw a, a 1D lattice. And suppose B is a unitary operator acting in a given site. Uh, and A is an observable at distance R away. Let psi be an arbitrary initial state, and let A of T be the Heisenberg evolution of the uh, operator A under some Hamiltonian H then the effect on this observable A due to the disturbance B can be quantified as follows. We take the expectation value of A of T in the original state and subtract it from the expectation value of A of T in this quenched uh, perturbed state uh, B psi. So now let's do some math on this. Um, uh, let's introduce uh, B dagger B here, which is identity. And now we recognize a commutator, A of T B minus B A of T. So let's write it out explicitly. Now we bound uh, 
the, this expectation value by the size of the largest eigenvalue, which is what these double bar, bars mean, the operator norm. Finally, B is unitary, so it doesn't change uh, the size of the largest eigenvalue. And finally, we arrive at this uh, operator norm or the largest eigenvalue of this unequal time commutator. And we call this a signal um, uh, at, at time t distance r away. And Lee Robinson bounds provide, provide bounds on that uh, signal. So let's be a little bit more specific. Let's start with short range interactions. So the Hamiltonian is now a nearest neighbor Hamiltonian uh, acting uh, where each term h i i plus one acts on neighboring sites. And we will assume that the largest eigenvalue of each of these terms is bounded by one. Um, but other than that, uh, we will allow for arbitrary uh, time dependence. And in fact, although I didn't show them here, we will even allow for arbitrarily strong time dependent on-site terms. So under these assumptions, uh, back in 1972, uh, Lieb and Robinson were able to show that uh, the signal after time t a distance r away um, is bounded by e to the vt minus r, where v is a Lieb Robinson velocity uh, of uh, order one, and it just comes from this one right here. So what does this mean? Uh, so let's uh, set this uh, to some constant epsilon, and let's solve for um, t as a function of r. And we find that t is basically r, so since v is of order one. Uh, and what this expression tells us is that for r greater than t, the signal must necessarily be small, while inside this causal region where r is less than t, the signal could be large. So it means that the shortest time to send the quantum information over a distance r is bounded from below by, um, uh, by r. So it cannot be faster than r. Uh, so given how general uh, this uh, problem and this bound are, uh, it, it, they have lots of applications. Uh, in particular, as we started, uh, you know, stated earlier, quantum communication through spin chains. Um, but also, uh, these bounds constrain the growth uh, of entanglement in quantum system, speeds of quantum computers, and lots and lots of other things that we will mention later in the talk. So now what we would like to do now is to uh, uh, understand what happens to this Lee Robinson bound, uh, but for the case of one of R to the alpha interactions. In particular, we're interested in the shape of this causal region or this effective light cone. And in particular, we want to find out uh, the shape of this boundary uh, T uh, going roughly as F of R. Uh, so what is that function? In other words, what is the shortest time T to send quantum information over a distance R? How does it depend on R? So let's again be a little bit more specific. Uh, now our Hamiltonian consists of two qubit terms uh, that couple uh, all sites. Um, however, we assume that the uh, largest eigenvalue of the term coupling sites i and j um, is bounded by one uh, over distance to the power alpha. So again, uh, as in the short range case, uh, will allow for arbitrary time dependence uh, subject to this constraint. Um, again, although I didn't show them here, will allow for arbitrarily strong time dependent on site terms. And we will consider, in fact, all alpha greater than or equal to zero. So now I'm not going to uh, bore you with the uh, derivations of the resulting bounds. I'll just tell you uh, what the best known results are. So again, we're asking the question of what is the shortest time t to send quantum information over a distance r. d will be the dimension of our uh, system. And then our answer will depend on alpha, uh, which is this one of our r to the alpha you know, right here, where we have the axis here now of alpha, where alpha equal to 0 means all to all interactions, and alpha equal to infinity is nearest neighbor interactions. So until um, you know, recently, uh, the uh, best bound for these large values of alpha above 2d was our bound, which said that uh, t is bounded from below by r to the beta for some beta less than 1. So we're able to show that it's bounded uh, by this algebraic function, where, in fact, this beta approached uh, 1 as alpha uh, went to infinity. However, very recently, uh, Guajara and Saito, as well as uh, Chen and Lucas, proved that, in fact, uh, above 
uh, 2d plus 1, alpha greater than d plus 1, in fact, is linear. So you cannot send your quantum information over a distance r in time that's faster uh, than linear for these large values of alpha. And this is a big deal. And now between d and 2d, the best bound we know is, in fact, the, uh, probably pretty loose is this logarithmic bound. And we also know what happens for these small values of alpha as well, but uh, I'm not going to bore you uh, with the details unless somebody asks uh, later. So maybe I can pause now. If there are any questions, I can uh, answer a couple. Um, uh, so we have a couple of questions. So one is from me. Um, and so the question is, what about interactions that are that don't just decay as a power law, but are oscillatory? So you could have something like sine of r over r. And sort of from a calculus point of view, this technically gives you a convergent integral, but it's very, very delicate. I don't know where right, you right. say that belongs. Yeah, so as far as, you know, as far as these bounds go, you know, uh, it's still bounded, uh, you know, by one over r. Um, so for me, that's just basically alpha equals to one, and I can go to town with that. Uh, now, of course, because it's oscillatory, and any, uh, you know, for any kind of uh, real dynamics, you know, it'll probably uh, kind of not saturate, you know, whatever information propagation uh, bounds we give. So in general, as so this is the answer probably to many of the questions that I often get is, in general, any specific Hamiltonian will not saturate any of these bounds. So, um, uh, but, but it will be, it will obey, it will obey these bounds. Great, thank you. Uh, so we have another question from Dan Stamperkern which is how is the bound for propagation of quantum information different from similar bounds for classical information? Right. Um, so, um, I mean, maybe sort of a, one answer is, um, is that we really need to uh, consider here lattice systems. Um, so often, you know, classical systems, maybe, uh, maybe you're thinking about some sort of a classical sort of dynamics uh, where you have um, sort of a continuum of uh, degrees of freedom. Um, so, so these bounds don't apply there. Uh, now, if you want to ask about uh, the propagation of classical information um, within the context of these quantum models, so basically kind of classical signaling, uh, then uh, these bounds you know, constrain that uh, as well. Um, and maybe what you're getting at is something that I might uh, mention later, you know, if I have time, uh, you can ask actually for different types of quantum information propagation. Like maybe you want to send quantum information from one end of the system to the other, independently of what the state of the qubits is between the, between, between the two, uh, you know, points that you're trying to send information through. And that's actually a very different and harder task than to send the quantum information from one end to the other, knowing what you have in the middle. Uh, so, you know, within the setup, uh, you know, classical information, you know, we're still, it's still, it's bounded uh, as well by this. Um, but I'm not sure if I'm answering the question, but maybe. I think that was a very helpful answer. Um, so maybe I'll give one more, which is from John Simon. And so the question is, does having interactions vary in time, for example, sinusoidally affect the, the impact of, or left-right propagation of the information? Does that give it a directionality? Um, I mean, it's, I mean, it could, um, uh, right? Um, it's just that, uh, I mean, again, as far as these bounds are concerned, uh, that's not what this is about. Um, uh, but I mean, John, you know probably uh, better than anyone that if you're clever about sort of uh, imprinting phases, uh, you know, you can get some uh, directionality, so. Uh, sorry, when I said wrote LR, I meant Lee Robinson. Oh, uh, sorry. I just meant, can you, can you, can you change the, the scaling by modulating in time? Like, can you make the information propagate faster, for example? Uh, in, in, any, in, in a system, in a given system, of course you can. Uh, but like, as far as these bounds go, like the bounds just say, like, as long as you're bounded, it's the same answer as to Alicia's question. Uh, um, right, so the bound still applies, but uh, you know, it can be very loose and maybe by shaking, you can uh, make it less loose. Okay. Should I move on? Yeah, I think that would be good. We had a lot of good okay. questions, but we should let you keep going. Okay, good. So uh, let's continue, and there'll be uh, more opportunities for questions later. So, so these are uh, kind of this overview of the bounds. Let me now discuss some applications. Uh, 
So we started with this uh, kind of local quench example. Uh, and so of course, Lee Robinson bounds constrain how quickly an observable A distance R away uh, from the perturbation, you know, we'll see uh, the signal. It turns out that these Lee-Robinson bounds also constrain uh, how quickly connected correlations grow after a global quench. So suppose you start with a, uh, an initial state where all qubits are in state zero, and you let the system evolve under your one over the alpha Hamiltonian, and you observe this connected correlator. So at time equal to zero, because you have a product state, uh, the connected correlator vanishes because this uh, expectation value factorizes. However, as time goes on, um, you know, these connected correlations uh, get established as your information propagates uh, through the, um, uh, through your system. And then the Lee-Robinson bounds constrain how quickly those build up. Uh, Lee-Robinson bounds also uh, can, can allow you to prove entanglement area laws for dynamics and for gap ground states. So in particular, one can show that for sufficiently large values of alpha, that is, if these one of our the alpha interactions fall off sufficiently quickly, uh, the entanglement of a given uh, subregion uh, cannot grow. Uh, it grows at a rate that is uh, not faster than a rate proportional to its uh, to its uh, boundary area, or in two dimensions, proportional to its perimeter. And it sort of makes sense because. Uh, um, the uh, terms in your Hamiltonian that can increase the entanglement in this subregion are the, only the terms that straddle the boundary. Um, and the number of those terms, it sort of uh, scales, at least in the nearest neighbor case, it scales as the perimeter. And a similar argument can be applied for sufficiently quickly decaying long range interactions. And you can also say something similar, in fact, for, you know, for the case of the area law in ground states that are separated from excited states by a gap. Uh, you can also use these Lee Robinson bounds to prove that uh, uh, connected correlations, these types of correlations in gap ground states, fall off no slower than one of R to the alpha, where uh, A0 and AR is separated by a distance R. And this is the generalization of the short range uh, um, equivalent, which shows that correlations cannot fall off slower than an exponential in R. Uh, it turns out you can also prove uh, lower bounds on how quickly you can prepare topologically ordered states from a product state. And this again makes sense because uh, topologically ordered states, uh, you know, topological order relies on having long range entanglement. And we just talked about how uh, Lee Robinson bounds uh, constrain how quickly you can create entanglement. Uh, you can also uh, prove bounds uh, on heating, on the heating rate in periodically driven systems. So in particular, if you locally drive uh, uh, a system with a uh, driving frequency omega that's much larger than the local energy scale, then a single quantum of energy omega uh, must, must spread over many sites in order to be absorbed. Uh, however, Lee Robinson bounds constrain how quickly information can propagate between these sites. And that's why you can use them to uh, uh, show that heating must necessarily be slow. Uh, you can also use these bounds to design a more gate efficient digital quantum simulation protocols. So in digital quantum simulation, you're trying to decompose a uh, unitary uh, time evolution operator under some Hamiltonian H into some standard set of single qubit and two qubit gates. And now if you know that your Hamiltonian uh, decays uh, with distance as one of R to the alpha, and as a result, um, uh, the propagation of uh, information and the spread of entanglement in the system is constrained, you can use this information to design a more gate efficient uh, simulation protocol compared to the case where this Hamiltonian has no such locality constraints. Furthermore, if you're only interested in the value of the local observable, not in the full wave function, then you can further simplify your life by throwing out basically and not caring about the part of the wave function that is far away from this local observable. And this can, again, make things more efficient. Um, it's perhaps also not surprising that Lee Robinson bounds allow you to place uh, lower bounds on the scrambling time. Because in quantum scrambling, quantum information originally stored in some subregion uh, is uh, lost and uh, goes into the complement of that region. Uh, and of course, Lee Robinson bounds, they uh, provide a bound on how quickly information uh, propagates. So, they can again be used to bound the scrambling time. 
And if I have time at the end of the talk, I will uh, you know, show five or six slides on how Lee Robinson bounds can also be used um, to uh, uh, design uh, classical simulation algorithms for quantum systems. So I can maybe uh, pause uh, for a few more questions. Okay, great. So we have a couple. So uh, one question is from Monica and she asks, are there specific examples of systems with power law interactions that are known to saturate the Hastings coma bound with correlations propagating logarithmic in time perhaps? Uh, not, uh, not, in the, um, uh, not for the values of alpha for which the Hastings coma bound applies. Uh, so we don't believe that uh, like it applies for alpha between D and uh, 2D and um, we don't believe that it's tight. I will actually t talk about this, uh, like about what the fastest protocols are in those values of alpha. No, so uh, that's a great question. We can get logarithmic uh, uh, state transfer or quantum information times at alpha equal to D, but at alpha equal to D, the Hastings coma bound doesn't apply. Okay, great, thank you. Um, so our next question is from Sunwon Choi. And he's asking, I was wondering if any of the concepts presented today could be generalized to imaginary time evolution. Are there oh, related a, studies or is the problem not defined at all for imaginary time? That's a great question. So we've asked ourselves this question before and I think, um, um, I, I think some things can be said, uh, but I don't think we've, uh, we've uh, at least I haven't looked at it deeply enough to, to, say, uh, to say either way. I think that's a great question. Um, yeah, we, we should think about it some more. Okay, and then maybe one last one from Bill Phillips before we move on. And he asks, is an area or perimeter law independent of the shape of the region being enclosed? For example, is there any constraint about being convex or God forbid, simply connected? Um, no, I think it's, uh, I mean, if you have a really weird region where it's like all boundary and no volume, then it kind of becomes funny, but uh, uh, probably, but no, I don't think, uh, I think for like, I think it's okay either way. Okay, great. Thank you very much. So we'll let you keep going then. Okay, great. So um, now to get to actually to Monica's question, um, now how tight are these bounds? Uh, so we know that these are the bounds that we have for the shortest time t to send quantum information over a distance r with these one over the alpha interaction and d dimensions. Now how tight are these? What are the fastest known protocols? So for alpha greater than 2d plus one, we're good because we can even use nearest neighbors just to hop uh, at a constant velocity and saturate this linear dependence. Uh, now between d and 2d plus one, the best known protocols are these algebraic protocols where time goes as r to the gamma for some gamma less than one, uh, which was shown in, in a combination of various papers. And we also have some results for small alpha that I'm not gonna sort of confuse you with. So uh, the important point about this uh, line here, and this is what Monica was getting at, is actually the only place where our bounds and our protocols uh, agree is above 2d plus one where they're both linear. But turns out everywhere else, including for these small values of alpha, there's a significant gap in the scaling between the best protocols and the best bounds. But we are sort of uh, getting better and better you know, as we write more papers. So let me focus on this uh, sublinear protocol here, which is, which is kind of amazing. So uh, in particular, it means that if you're in three dimensions where d is equal to three, uh, so then 2d plus one is seven. And then it means that actually van der Waals interactions in three dimensions, so alpha equal to six, they in fact allow for a sublinear uh, state transfer protocol because this gamma is less than one. So I was kind of surprised by that. So I'm gonna explain now how this protocol works. Uh, and to do this, I'll start with a one dimensional case where this protocol will give you a uh, state transfer time of r to the alpha over three. So it'll be sublinear for alpha less than three where three is exactly two d plus one for the case d equals one. So how does this work? So I'm trying to send information uh, from this uh, red qubit uh, in some unknown state a zero plus b one to this blue qubit where I assume everybody except for the red qubit is in the state zero. Uh, so this is my goal. Uh, so how am I gonna do this? Um, all right, and there a distance r part. So the protocol will consist of several steps, each of duration uh, scaling roughly as t. And I will choose actually my t uh, later. 
So let me first apply a control dot from this first qubit to the second qubit uh, to create the, to encode my initial qubit in this two qubit state, A0 plus B11. So let me, let me apply now another control dot from the second qubit to the third qubit. Now my initial state is encoded in this GHZ type state. And then I keep repeating this uh, T times to encode my initial state in this uh, kind of GHZ-like, uh, cat-like state. Now I applied a Hadamard gate on this last qubit to change it from zero to zero plus one. And I again apply controlled knots. Uh, and again, I apply them T times to create a GHG state here. So now let me call this uh, region here A, uh, and I will denote this uh, zero, zero, zero state by zero bar and one, 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 one state by one bar. And similarly, I'll call this region B, and I'll denote uh, these two states as zero bar and one bar. And now, uh, and this is also zero bar. So now the key step, I turn on interactions between uh, every point in A and every point in B of exactly the same strength, uh, the full, this uh, one of R to the alpha strength, uh, where I have a projector in the one state of qubit I and the projector in the one state of qubit J. So what does this do? Well, it's very simple. It actually means that the state one bar, one bar picks up a phase at a rate proportional to t squared over r to the alpha. So one of r to the alpha is just from here, while t squared just comes from the fact that there are t squared terms in this Hamiltonian. So there are t uh, ones in the this one bar and t ones in this one bar. So that's why it's t squared. So this means that if I uh, act uh, with this uh, Hamiltonian for, for time t, then the phase picked up is t cubed over r to the alpha. And this means that if I choose t scaling as r to the alpha over 3, I can pick up a phase of 4 to 1. So in particular, I can pick up a phase of pi, which will exactly put a minus sign in front of this state 1 bar 1 bar. So in this r to the alpha over 3 is precisely our answer, but we're not done yet. Um, so, so this is what we've done so far. So uh, we've been able to encode the initial qubit, which was on uh, uh, qubit A, qubit, this red qubit, excuse me, not qubit A. We we're able to encode this in this very complicated state that's over these regions uh, A and B. So now let's undo the C naughts. So uh, let's undo these C naughts right here. And let's also undo these C naughts right there. Uh, so what this does, it actually disentangles all of the intermediate qubits except for the red qubit and the blue qubit. Um, and we just get the same state, but it's now just a simple entangled states on the red and the blue qubit. Then we apply a Hadamard gate on the blue qubit. And finally, uh, we've, you know, through this pretty complicated process, we were able to encode the initial state A0 plus B1 on the red qubit in this bell-like state on the two qubits. And now you see the picture is kind of symmetric now between the red and the blue. So what we do now is we undo the entire thing we just did, except with the roles of the red and blue reversed. And so uh, we finally arrive at the state A0 plus B1 on this last qubit. OK? Um, so uh, I should point out that uh, if we want this protocol to work for any background state, uh, something that we can call universal state transfer, not just for this uh, zero state, but for any state, um, a state that we don't know, then actually uh, we cannot go sublinear for alpha greater than 2.5. But this guy is sublinear for alpha you know, up to three. So this works also for higher dimensions, uh, and it gives a R to the alpha over 2d plus 1. And this is what I said kind of earlier, that amazingly, in three dimensions, even the van der Waals interactions that have alpha equal to six uh, allow for a sublinear protocol. And if you, had, if you had told me a year ago that this is possible, I wouldn't have believed you. Um, so maybe uh, questions again. Okay, great. So we have a couple. So the first is from Wen Chao Shu uh, asking, can this study provide some guideline for designing quantum circuits? It looks like a two qubit gate is a very short range interaction. So maybe they're not the best choice, but can you transfer things around? Yes, yes, absolutely. Yeah, we're, yeah. Um, and we, we have some papers on that, absolutely. So once you, I mean, 
that's so as far as the bounds go, I gave some applications. And now as far as these protocols go, these protocols are exactly useful for speeding up uh, quantum gates, you know, uh, full quantum algorithms. Absolutely great question. Um, I think that's the main one that we have for the moment. So maybe we'll stop you again later shortly. Perfect. Yeah, we'll, 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 we'll stop again soon. Um, okay, so uh, now um, an outlook uh, kind of on these bounds and protocols. Um, so as we said, um, these uh, bounds and protocols are not yet tight. They don't really agree with each other. Uh, however, we would like to tighten uh, both the bounds and the protocols to saturation. Um, um, the other thing we can do is uh, we can ask, uh, we can restrict our problem or uh, our question in some way. In particular, we can restrict our model, for example, just to a single particle. Um, uh, and then we can get tighter bounds. Uh, and in fact, in the case of a single particle, our bounds and our protocols actually almost agree, which is maybe not surprising. Uh, this is a much simpler problem. Uh, you can also ask uh, not for a generic uh, kind of quantum information propagation, but you can ask for something more specific like this background state independent state transfer, which is harder to achieve than uh, you know, a generic kind of quantum information uh, transfer. And here we can get tighter bounds. Similarly, if, you're, um, if you want to uh, bound uh, uh, this infinite uh, temperature out of time order correlator, it's also something more specific. And for these more specific things, uh, we can again get uh, tighter bounds. And this is sort of maybe partially gets at an advanced question. Uh, similarly, you can try to generalize this um, uh, beyond what I uh, talked about. In particular, you can generalize this to, uh, to uh, open systems. Uh, and maybe this you know, uh, kind of somewhat relates to uh, what um, uh, soon one asked, but not quite, right? Because this imaginary time evolution isn't something that actually happens. So, uh, I mean, it's not the same thing, um, but maybe some tools are similar. Uh, so you can also imagine generalizing this to many body interactions uh, where your Hamiltonians, instead of acting on uh, sort of pairs of qubits, they act on larger numbers of qubits. And this has also been done. Um, and in general, you know, the hope is after we complete uh, all of this, uh, this will improve our understanding of uh, equilibrium and non-equilibrium properties of uh, long-range interacting uh, many-body systems, and also allow us to speed up um, and bound uh, quantum computing, uh, quantum simulation, classical simulation, preparation of entangled states for metrology and sensing, um, et cetera. So I can pause again here. Okay, uh, so we have one question from Lee Martin, which is how likely is it that one can approach these bounds with a static Hamiltonian in your view? Right. Um, um, so, uh, so if you want, uh, if you want the single Hamiltonian to um, saturate this bound kind of at all t and r, uh, then I think it's very unlikely. But maybe you can design a static Hamiltonian, like maybe you can design a family of static Hamiltonians, such that uh, like if you choose your t, uh, if you choose your r uh, kind of nt, the static Hamiltonian like will saturate that particular pair of t and r, but then you need to move to like a different Hamiltonian to like kind of saturate uh, uh, another kind of point on the slide cone. So, uh, Maybe this is possible, but I think it's, I mean, I think it's unlikely that for these long range interactions, uh, time independent Hamiltonian will allow you to kind of trace the full, uh, the full uh, light cone, but hey, who knows? Yeah, but I think it's unlikely. Um, in short range, it does work, right? In short range, like anything, actually anything generic, basically it kind of saturates your linear light cone. So, uh, but for long range for these fancy, uh, fancy dependencies on R, I find this unlikely, but great question. Okay, great. So we have another question from Dan Slichter. So he's asking for the R to the alpha over three protocol, the point at which you apply your coupling Hamiltonian between A and B was confusing. It seems that the essential physics are all encapsulated in exactly how this works. Um, it seems unclear that the creation of such a Hamiltonian is trivial, especially if it doesn't involve intermediate qubits. And so he's looking for some clarification there. Um. So let's see, um, did I even, uh, right, so uh, right. So this is the Hamilton we're applying. So first of all, um, 
yeah, so I'm not saying how to, uh, I'm not explaining how to do it in any specific uh, experimental system. And actually, I think this is something interesting to figure out how to do, and we're working on that. Um, so we're thinking about polar molecules and Rydberg atoms and things like this. Um, as far as my model goes, so I assumed uh, that I can arbitrarily turn on and off, um, you know, interactions between any pair of qubits, provided that these interactions, you know, obey my one of R to the alpha constraint. So now if I take my two points that are furthest away, this blue and the red point, I'm not allowed to turn an interaction between those furthest away points that is stronger than one of our R to the alpha. Uh, so in fact, what I'm doing here is I'm turning on this kind of a weakest allowable interaction, which is between the uh, lowest qubits, but I'm just saying the ones qubits that are closer together, I will also turn only one of our R to the alpha. So uh, I'm not gonna make the interaction stronger as they come in. So this interaction is allowed within my model. So it's indeed, a, so for the purposes of trying to uh, kind of saturate my bound, this is a valid thing. Now, if you're asking how to do this in reality, it's very difficult, right? Because in your, I mean, whether you have, you know, Rydberg atoms or polar molecules or anything else, um, you don't really have enough knobs uh, to, uh, turn on, to turn on and off individually, you know, your N squared interactions. What you control really are your N atoms. Um, and so uh, how to do this in reality is tricky, uh, but you know, we have some ideas. And I mean, we have a paper on something related. Um, we have a slower protocol where we need to do something similar. So uh, the same ideas can, be, uh, can probably be applied. Uh, I'm not sure I fully answered your question. It was kind of long. Maybe I didn't fully understand it, but hopefully it gets at the, uh... yeah, thanks Dan for being a good listener. So we actually have a somewhat related question um, from Sun Wun Choi. And so the question is for this fast state transfer protocol is the sign of the interaction important and are Van der Waals good in that way? Like what changes? Um, I mean, for, for this one, for this one, the sign doesn't matter. I just need to pick up a phase of pi, right? So it's, uh, if it's, if it's all minus here, it doesn't matter. Um, now what matters actually, this relates to how one would actually do this. Um, so one way of doing something similar, you know, in another paper that we have, I mean, when I, I mean, by Zach Eldridge, where we had another sort of state transfer protocol, the way we often do this is we, um, um, we turn on some positive interaction between certain sets of qubits, and then we turn on negative interactions between certain other sets of qubits such that, you know, they cancel and we get something remaining. Um, so we often, uh, it's often convenient to be able to do both positive and negative to make this work. So it kind of relates also to the dance question. Um, so, uh, so in that sense, it's useful to be able to control the sign. Uh, and that's why, like, for, we had to do it with a, I forget actually what we do with polar molecules and Rydberg atoms, you know, we have some tricks for how to do this. Um, and maybe that's what you're getting at soon. I don't know. Good question. Okay, so I think we peppered you with a few questions and should maybe let you move on for a little bit. We can actually we can I think we're we're good. We can if there are more questions, let's let's keep going. All right, I'll keep them coming then. Um, so we have one question from see you're you're getting questions faster than I can read them. So um, that's great. I mean, I have like, I have like, actually I have like six slides left. So, um, you know, so. All right. Okay. Yeah. So then let me just gather questions and I'll pass them along. I guess Adam, um, you need to change your process. You need to have like five people reading questions. <laughs> so this is secretly why we said a few breaks. <laughs> Sorry. Um, all right. So, so one question is from Yuting Chen and this is, could you please comment on how entanglement entropy would grow in these systems and how you might measure it experimentally? Um, right, so, um, well, so this relates to, uh, you know, one of these applications on um, uh, dynamics of uh, entanglement growth. Like I, we, we have this paper where we prove a kind of an area law for entanglement dynamics. Actually, I kind of lied. It doesn't even use uh, Lee Robinson bounds. Um, but uh, if your interactions fall off sufficiently quickly, you know, they're basically uh, in some sense, um, you know, uh, short range enough that uh, the entanglement grows just at a rate proportional to the, uh, to, to the perimeter of your system in 2D. So in that sense, uh, you know, that's how quickly, uh, you know, the, the entanglement entropy of a, uh, a given region uh, can grow, but is sufficiently uh, um, quickly decaying one of our the alpha interactions. 
as for you know as for how to measure you know entanglement uh, entropy i mean again there are there are plenty of papers on this you know i don't think i'm actually on any of them but uh, there are lots of ideas you can use several copies you know uh, you can do some swaps you know uh, you can um, you can do these randomized measurements, which are not efficient, but cool. I mean, you know, there are lots of uh, ideas for doing this and some of them have already been done experimentally. All right, so the next question is from Ephraim Steinberg. And so it says, asymptotically sublinear transfer seems impossible as it's based on unphysical assumptions built into your Hamiltonians, which contain no retardation. How should I think about the relations between your protocols and relativity constraints? Right, right. Yeah, perfect question. Exactly. It's one of the, uh, one of the questions that you know, I often get. So, um, uh, right. So in this case, everything works under the assumption um, that um, that the uh, speed of light, basically, the time it takes for uh, light to travel from one end of the system to the other is negligible compared to everything else. Um, and in this case, you're allowed to write this effect of one over the alpha spin model. Um, but of course, you know, uh, I mean, you never have a one over the alpha spin model. I mean, like even your Coulomb interactions are not really, you know, um, kind of instantaneous. You know, when you wiggle something here, it takes a speed of light, uh, you know, uh, to communicate that motion there. So all of these things are only applicable under these assumptions. And eventually, if your systems become too big, you know, they break down. And actually, I mean, in the case of, say, uh, it, that's in the case of atoms whose interactions are mediated by photons. In the case of Chris Monroe's trapped ions, the interaction is actually mediated by phonons. So what you're, what you're asking for, it will actually break down much faster. It will break down much sooner when, when we need to actually worry about the propagation of these phonons. So uh, these breakdowns often happen. And then what you need to do is actually need to generalize your model. Then you need to include those photons or phonons into your model and consider these more generalized sort of uh, Lee Robinson like uh, bounds that allow for you know real rather than virtual uh, photons or real rather than virtual phonons. And there are some papers on this, uh, but there are more papers on this that remain to be written. So uh, great question, thanks. Excellent. All right, so we have another one from Nathaniel Leitao and he's asking, can one imagine calculating different bounds for operators supported on specific subspace of Hilbert space? For example, if one subspace is far detuned or gapped from another, can you get tighter bounds? Um, yeah, you're probably not within this. I mean, not within this framework because uh, here it's all you know very general kind of uh, like detunings like don't matter here. Like we allow for arbitrary time dependence, so you know I can wiggle my Hamiltonians to gap any detune to to sort of uh, close any uh, any gaps. Um, but you know one can always ask that question. It's probably these tools won't work. Um, so should I maybe just to make sure that I get to the end, maybe I can uh, continue yeah, to talk for like 10 minutes, then maybe finish the talk and then we can do more. That's that perfect. Good? Okay. Awesome questions. Um, okay. Oh no. To click through all of my animations. Oh man. Maybe I have time for another question while I click through this. <laughs> um, we'll let you have a breather while the animations click by. Okay, here, here. Okay, good. So, uh, so for the next ten minutes, I will talk about just uh, one application that I glossed over um, in the application section. Uh, is this application of the Robinson bounds to uh, the design of algorithms for classical simulation of quantum systems, as opposed to quantum simulation? So, uh, our belief in the power of quantum computers, um, and more general, our excitement over studying uh, large interacting quantum systems, they both come. Um, from the fact that, uh, you know, from our belief that quantum systems uh, uh, that are physically realistic, they cannot be efficiently classically simulated. That's why we're, most of us are in this business. But what exactly does it mean to classically simulate a quantum system? Uh, so let's consider a typical kind of modern quantum experiment where you have an initial state of n qubits, uh, where here for n equals to two, they both start in state zero. Then we evolve these n qubits under uh, some Hamiltonian H uh, to get the generic superposition, in this case, of the four uh, basis states. And then we measure every qubit on the computational basis. And we get one of the uh, four uh, bit strings with a probability corresponding to the amplitude squared um, of the corresponding state. So it means that uh, one experiment here gives you one sample uh, from uh, this distribution. 
So it means that a, a perfect classical simulator of this experiment is a classical algorithm that produces samples from the same distribution. Now we're interested in efficient simulation. So then uh, an efficient classical simulator is just a classical algorithm that produces uh, samples from the same distribution in time that's polynomial in the number of qubits. Now, quantum systems are never perfect, so it's not fair to ask for a classical simulator to produce uh, samples from exactly the same distribution. So then we defined uh, an efficient approximate simulator um, as, a, as an algorithm that produces samples uh, efficiently, uh, well, that produces samples from the distribution that's epsilon close to the desired distribution in time that's polynomial, both in the number of qubits and in one over this uh, distance between the distributions. And for the you know, remaining five slides, or four, uh, I will uh, be talking about these approximate samplers. Um, however, I will drop the word approximate for simplicity. Uh, and you know, it was shown a few years ago that actually, uh, um, I mean, good evidence was provided for the fact that uh, approximate classical sampling from, from some quantum systems is hard. Um, uh, that is, it cannot be done efficiently. And in the case of uh, Ahrens and Arkhipov, they dealt with uh, non-interacting bosons, uh, and it was called boson sampling. In the case of Brenner and collaborators, they uh, dealt with some spin models. Um, so the point of the slide is that this uh, sampling complexity, that is how hard it is to sample from a given distribution, is actually a key tool for studying uh, many body quantum systems because that's what many uh, modern quantum experiments do. They, they sample from uh, distributions. Um, and indeed, uh, you know, people have realized that uh, um, sort of probably one of the most natural approaches to uh, quantum supremacy, that is to showing that your quantum system can do something that a classical system cannot do, is just to make your quantum uh, system sample from some distribution that's classically hard to sample from. So this was indeed the uh, Google approach where they use superconducting qubits to run some random circuits and then sample um, from the output. Uh, you can also play a similar game, for example, in Chris Monroe's trapped ion chains where you can implement a spin Hamilton in up to 50 qubits. Uh, and in this paper, which was about something else, it was actually about a QAOA, um, you know, we played a game of sampling at 12 qubits and, you know, and provided some theoretical evidence that um, if uh, the system was larger and perhaps had a little bit more control, you know, it would have been also hard uh, to sample from. Uh, so now what happens to this um, uh, sampling complexity as a function of time? Uh, so suppose we start with a product state uh, and measure my qubits, you know, right away, uh, or we can imagine evolving uh, for some time t to get this general state. So if you measure right away, then we always get zero, zero. So this is very easy to sample from. I just give the same uh, answer every time. So this is a classically easy distribution. Uh, on the other hand, uh, you know, by these uh, works here, you know that for a large system, um, the, most, the, more, the most general distribution is hard to sample from classically. So this immediately kind of shows you that uh, it looks like there's a sort of dynamical phase transition uh, from easy sampling to hard sampling uh, as a function of time. So maybe a cartoon of this uh, uh, is the following. You can think of all quantum states, and then some of them are easy to sample classically. Uh, so then if you initially start with a state that's easy to sample classically, then as a function of time, you can become hard to sample undergoing this dynamical phase transition uh, in the middle. So let's compare this to a typical condensed matter phase diagram where uh, as a function of temperature and other system parameters, you can have an ordered phase and a disordered phase um, separated by uh, a line of phase transitions where the ordered phase, for example, can have a, a non-zero sigma z order parameter and a disordered phase can have a zero sigma z order parameter. And then as a function of temperature, the order parameter undergoes a non elasticity uh, at the phase transition. Now, uh, with the uh, development of the synthetic quantum matter, um, people now study dynamical phase transitions where the temperature is now replaced with time. And then you start with some initial state. And as a function of time, some order parameter undergoes a non elasticity uh, So what we're saying is that let's use the sampling complexity as a type of uh, dynamical order parameter where at early times it's easy, 
and at long times it's hard. Uh, so this is basically the uh, sort of the last slide. Uh, let me give you one example um, of how this uh, works. Uh, I consider interacting bosons on a lattice. Um, and in particular, I start with a very specific state of n evenly spaced bosons on an n by n 2d square lattice. So like this, I space them perfectly evenly on an n by n square lattice. And because they're exactly n of them, they're actually spaced by exactly square root of n. And then I'll let these bosons evolve under this generalized Bose-Hubbard type Hamiltonian, where we have hopping uh, from side j to i with a hopping amplitude that is time dependent, but I assume it's bounded by one over distance uh, between sites i and j to the power alpha. And that's where these Lee Robinson bounds will come in. Uh, and this is my favorite uh, Hubbard U interaction where nj is the number of uh, bosons on side j. So this uh, penalizes uh, large numbers of bosons uh, uh, on side j. Now, why is this Hamiltonian interesting? Well, if alpha is equal to infinity, then these are uh, nearest neighbor interactions. And this just corresponds to ultra-cold atoms uh, in optical lattices, uh, bosonic ultra-cold atoms in optical lattices. Uh, on the other hand, if u is equal to infinity, then it means that uh, the bosons are hardcore. So in every site, we can either have uh, zero bosons or one boson. So we effectively get a spin one half uh, spin model. Uh, and this becomes an S plus S minus Hamiltonian on that spin model. And this describes uh, um, spin models with Rydberg atoms and V-centers, polar molecules, trapped ions, uh, whatever you have. So this Hamiltonian captures a, a lot of uh, interesting physics. Uh, and so we just ask the following simple question. We start with this very specific initial state. We'll let it evolve under this time-dependent Hamiltonian. And we measure after some time where the bosons are. And so the question, is this experiment easy or hard to uh, classically simulate in the worst case? Where in the worst case, I mean, uh, for all possible choices of JFT, you know, I try to choose the hardest one. Uh, so is it easy or hard? In other words, uh, uh, is it easy or hard to sample from exactly the same distribution of where I find my bosons? Um, well, and here's the answer. Um, so on the x-axis here, we have the time which can either be independent of n, so some constant time, time scaling as square root of n, n is again the number of bosons, where time scale linearly uh, with n and so on. On the y-axis, we have alpha, where alpha equal to zero means, uh, you know, hopping is allowed between, uh, you know, any pair of sites uh, with strength one, and alpha equal to infinity is nearest neighbor hopping. And it kind of intuitively makes sense that if the hopping is short range and time is short, uh, then the sampling is easy, but if um, hopping is long range and time is long, then the sampling is hard. Um, and now to prove this easiness, well, we actually just divide our lattice into these boxes. Uh, and then we use Lee Robinson bounds to show that uh, the bosons don't really uh, leave their own boxes. Uh, and then you can just simulate their individual boxes and compute the full probability from there. It's pretty simple, actually. And to do the hardness proofs, we just uh, um, reduce our problem to some of these other known problems like boson sampling or this uh, spin sampling, which is called the uh, IQP sampling. And the cool thing about this diagram is that uh, actually uh, the only place uh, where you can hope uh, that your system has a exponential speed up over classical uh, is, uh, is this region, uh, this hard region. Now here we don't know, so it might be hard too. Uh, but in the easy region, uh, we know that there'll be no exponential speed ups. Uh, so let me summarize this last uh, final part. Um, so uh, we suggest to use sampling complexity as an order parameter, signaling dynamical phase transitions from easy to hard. Um, so turns out Anderson localized static Hamiltonians are easy at all times. Uh, and then uh, you can get a sampling phase transition as a function of disorder that will go from a, a hard sampling at low disorder to easy sampling at high disorder. And more generally, we're thinking about uh, uh, drawing these uh, uh, phase boundaries uh, using sampling complexity in time and parameter space for you know, interacting fermions, spins, anions, to distinguish uh, MBL phases from uh, thermalizing phases, topological from trivial, uh, and also compute the sampling complexity for ground states, uh, thermal states, open systems, systems that uh, uh, have a partial management measurements uh, throughout time evolution, uh, et cetera. 
And also we're trying to understand how the sampling complexity relates to entanglement. And of course, we're, we're not the only ones who are thinking about all this stuff. So let me thank uh, my uh, uh, group members. So, you know, I mentioned a lot of work in passing. So the people who led uh, some of these papers that I mentioned are Ming, Mike, uh, Joshua, and Zach, Andrew, Abinov, uh, Ishada, Adam, Olis, and we had a, this very nice collaboration with Andy uh, at Boulder. Uh, and lots of other people contributed to these numerous papers. So Jeremy, Jim, Ali Hamed, Andrew, Yuan, Charles, Sukwan, Bill, Paraj, Fernando, Paul, Spiris, Yifan, Chifang, and Dima. And thank you for your attention. So we have another few minutes for questions. Thank you for the wonderful talk, Alexei. So you've accrued many more questions and so we'll continue to pepper you. Um, so the first one actually came essentially in parallel from Dan Slichter and Ehud Altman, which is why is it, is it clear that it should be actually a phase transition from easy to hard and sampling and not a crossover? Right, right, right. Yeah, so, um, so it, it, it has to be a transition because uh, the way we define um, hard is by saying that it's not easy. So there's nothing in between actually. Um, so as long as we, uh, you know, as long as we choose, uh, you know, so I choose my alpha, then I choose my time to scale in some way with n, and then I just ask asymptotically, you know, uh, is is it easy? Meaning, is the is the best, uh, you know, classical algorithm to do the same thing? Uh, is it efficient or not? And it's a well-defined question. It might be hard to answer, but it's well defined. Uh, so is the algorithm polynomial or not? And if it's polynomial, I say it's easy. And if there's no polynomial algorithm, I just say it's hard. Uh, so in that sense, uh, it's it's a transition. Now, um, I mean, on the other hand, it's all about the scaling. So uh, right, so it's uh, it's a transition in how in how say time scales. So maybe uh, so maybe maybe you will have sort of uh, you know some question like maybe you're not happy with that, and that's okay. Right. So. Uh, okay. Great. Um, so the next question is from Nicholas Muller. And the question is, do the dynamical phase transitions from easy to hard have anything to do with the dynamical quantum phase transitions a la Heil and Polkovnikov, which are quantified by a Lokshmid echo? Um, right, so yeah, so like when I was drawing these dynamical phase transitions, you know, that's what I was sort of referring to, um, like uh, to compare to condensed matter phase transitions. Uh, not that I know of actually at the moment, uh, not that I know of. Uh, like especially with the Loschmidt echo, like you can, you can get these phase transitions that like uh, like the, the non elasticities just can keep happening, right? You get one then the other, if I remember correctly, but this thing just goes sort of one way. So uh, I don't immediately know a relationship, but there could be. Um. Okay, great, thank you. Um, so another question came from Mehdi Hassan. And this one was, would you comment on the speed of information travel in momentum space rather than real space? Is there any bound in that case? Um, so, right, so the first thing I would need to do is I would need to write uh, my model uh, in momentum space in such a way that uh, each point in this momentum space is a finite dimensional Hilbert space. Um, so if I just have one particle, that's easy, right? So if I have one particle um, hopping in a lattice, I can just uh, change my basis from position to momentum. And then in momentum space, I also have a hopping model. It's just a different hopping model. And uh, you know, it's a hopping model with a different uh, sort of, um, uh, you know, different uh, uh, kind of distance dependence. And all of this in principle applies. So if you have this one of R to the alpha in momentum space, I mean, it doesn't matter. Now, if I'm considering instead of uh, a single particle, if I consider say these spin models, like I, I'm not even sure how to do that. Um, um, and, um, but I know for a single particle, it certainly works. So for more particles, one would need to think about. And then, I mean, of course, the whole point is that a uh, locality is important. So uh, in momentum, like even your most natural interactions are non-local. So uh, I, I expect that these bounds would be less useful in momentum space, uh, unless you specifically design things in such a way that things are local in momentum, uh, which sometimes happens uh, actually, right? So uh, there's this nice work from Bryce Gadway. He has these nice experiments where things happen in momentum space. Um, yeah. 
Okay, so maybe I'll pass on sort of one more question from Bill Phillips, and then after that, there will of course be the a discussion with Alexei in a separate Zoom room where people can pass along more questions and have a little bit more interaction. So uh, from Bill, he's asking, so concerning classical simulation, while one definition of simulation is to produce the same distribution, one can have a classical simulation that produces the actual wave function or density matrix of the quantum system, which gives the distribution, but in a, in a single calculation. And there's no need to run it again to get another result drawn from the same distribution, but, it's, um, but it still isn't efficient, right? Can you comment? Um, I mean, there are, there are many cases where, um, Right. I mean, this might not just be possible in the sense that your wave function is just too big, uh, right? So, uh, right, it has a, if it's on n qubits, there are two to the n amplitudes. Uh, so it's not even entirely clear how to pose the problem correctly, right? So, uh, I mean, you can ask, for example, um, for an algorithm that efficiently produces I mean, say different amplitudes together, not just the probabilities, which is I talked about, but different amplitudes together with the phase. Um, uh, and that's an interesting question and people think about that. Um, but like producing the full wave function, uh, it has this problem that there's just, it's too many things to produce. So if you ask for that, you are kind of uh, inefficient uh, from the get go. Um, Okay, great, thank you. I think that was a very useful answer. Um, and so I'll probably call it here. And so we should thank Alexei again for this wonderful talk. And I'll give you mostly silent applause from the muted panel. Um, and then I will actually take over the screen share for a second. Could you stop sharing, Alexei? Yeah, sorry. Great, thank you. So I just want to- uh, did, it, did it stop sharing? Yes, it did. Just want to give people information about the upcoming talks. Um, so the quantum science seminar continues to be on hiatus for the month of August, but we will be back next week with Ana Ansenjo Garcia from Columbia University talking about few and single body effects in 1D atomic arrays. Um, and I believe if you are in the Zoom, then the link to the post-seminar discussion with Alexei has been posted in the chat.